crave the fire's embrace for though my past with sin was etched his mercies did erase each time his purging cleanse is deeper i'm not sure that i'll survive yet the strength in growing weaker keeps my hungry soul alive the refiner's fire has now become my soul desire purged and cleansed Father in heaven, one more time this morning, we just want to thank you for touching our hearts so far in this service. Amen. Whether it be through song or testimony or the children's story or some other means, Lord, we thank you for seeking to find every avenue possible to bring blessings into our lives. Yeah. And Lord, as we reflect on this last church, we know that this is the church that addresses us in this time. And we know that the lessons that you conveyed to these believers apply to us. And we pray that you would speak to us in a powerful way as we think about what you want to share with us through the scriptures this morning. We pray for your spirit to bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As you're thinking about Laodicea, I'd like to ask you some questions. Have you ever felt too comfortable spiritually to where you don't sense your need of Christ like you once did? You know, this is a condition that you wouldn't hear too many Christians actually say out loud. But I wonder how many of us are experiencing this even though we might not verbalize it. Now certainly there's nothing wrong with feeling comfortable spiritually as long as it doesn't get to the point to where we become complacent and lose a sense of our need for Christ. Here's a challenging question. Have you become a little bit too comfortable spiritually to where you don't sense this need like you used to? Or... Is the cry of your heart like the words of the famous Christian song, As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. Does your heart cry that? As far as you sensing your need and how your soul longs for Christ. I'm reminded of a story that I heard a Messianic Christian share at Camp Colloquia in the King Chapel years ago, he stood up there and he was describing a story about a rabbi who was instructing a young student of his in religious matters. And he took this, I don't know if it was a teenager, it was a young boy, probably a teenager, down to this body of water and he actually dunked this boy's head underwater and he held him under there. And, and the boy starts grasping and, and trying to get out and finally he let him up for air and the kid is just gasping and gasping. And he looked at the boy and said, that's 
how you must long after God to where you gasp for Him. You are so desperate for His presence, just like you were desperate for a breath of air. Amen. That's a powerful illustration. But I wonder how many of us long for the presence of Christ in our lives, like this boy longed for air. Beloved, we should sense our desperate need of Christ every day. Because if we lose this mindset, we are in danger of becoming comfortable and spiritually complacent, especially when times are good and things are going well. We are in great danger in these types of situations because spiritual pride is often the cause of this condition. And when spiritual pride takes over, we convince ourselves that we are spiritually okay when we are not. Very dangerous situation. Now, as a people, we have been spiritually prosperous as far as our message. We've been blessed with tremendous light into the Scriptures. So I believe that we face a special danger ourselves. The temptation to become spiritually proud to the point of self-sufficiency to where we lose our need. We lose the sense of our need of Christ. You know, it's easy as a pastor for me to do the work of God in my own strength. And I can tell you as a minister, it's, we, I face the temptation constantly to want to do things in my own strength and to want to think that I'm something special, that I can do what God wants me to do without God empowering me to do it. It's a great temptation. And as a people uh, of God who have been given great privileges and great light from God, there is this temptation to be proud about it. And to not think that we need to grow anymore spiritually and that there aren't new truths to discover. Sometimes we are content with the status quo spiritually. And I believe the cause of that is spiritual pride. We've got to be very careful that we don't lose our sense of our need of Christ for every waking moment of our lives. Why did Lucifer fall and become Satan? Pride, and that pride led him to think that he did not need God. What is the argument put forth in Patriarchs and Prophets? Lucifer told God, look, angels are sufficient to govern themselves. We don't need you, God. We're a law unto ourselves. We're strong enough to guide our own spiritual path. And as a result, he lost his way. And so didn't one-third of the heavenly family in that original rebellion. In heaven, a perfect place, by the way. Think about it. We face the same dangers because spiritual pride by itself is dangerous enough. But when it goes to the level to where we become overconfident and let our spiritual defenses down and lose sight of that need, then we think we're okay when in reality we're in a very deplorable condition. We must never think that we are okay spiritually to the point to where we become self-dependent. Now, when you look at the history that's outlined in the Word of God, why did Israel's kings lose their way? Why did they reject the message of the prophets and scribes and all the people that God sent to them with warning messages? They did not feel their need. They were proud. Things were okay. We're still safely behind our walls here in Jerusalem. No foreign power is going to take us over. God is with us. When in reality they were in deep and dark apostasy. And as prophets time and time again came to them with messages of rebuke and exhortation, they rebuffed them. And as a result, the Assyrian and Babylonian captivities loomed over the nation of Israel and the kingdom of Judah to the south. And eventually those kingdoms were taken off into captivity because of pride and because of lowering defenses because they did not sense their need of God while convincing him, themselves that God was with them. When you look at Belshazzar in the book of Daniel... How did he lose his life and lose the kingdom of Babylon? He was proud. He refused to sense his need of listening to his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. How about the religious leaders in the days of Christ and the apostles? Why did they reject their message? Because they were proud. 
They did not sense their need. How about the papacy? And how about... Uh, the, the papal power during the Dark Ages when the Reformers began to break the light of the Word of God to people. Why were they not receptive to the reforming message, the message of the Reformers? They didn't sense their need of greater light. And this all stems down to a common problem, and that is spiritual pride, brothers and sisters, to where we don't sense our need of God. Proverbs 16, verse 18 says... Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Amen. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, Let him that thinketh he stand, take heed, lest he fall. Yeah. Hebrews 2, 1 and 2, We should have a more earnest regard of those things that we've learned, lest at any time we let them slip. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Romans 13, 11, right? Now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. So let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light and be awake spiritually. You see, friends, what I'm sharing with you today is, is that we have a danger of becoming spiritually complacent to where we feel like maybe we've arrived, you know, I thought I arrived when I was baptized, and I thought I was something pretty special, and I thought to myself, you know, the fiery chariot's going to be coming any day now for me. And then I got married, <laughs> and I learned that I wasn't all that, to use a street term, and I learned that there was still a little bit of polishing left, and not even a little bit, a lot. <laughs> but you know, getting married to my wife helped me to sense my need of God, not because she was tough to deal with, but because I had a lot of growing to do. See, we, we are in danger of falling into these ruts to where we think we're okay, when in reality, we are really not. And it all comes from a, a proud attitude of spiritual complacency. Our greatest danger as those who have the oracles of God, is to become overconfident because of the spiritual prosperity that God has blessed us with so that we feel okay when we are really not okay. And there's a term for that in the Bible. Lukewarm. And that was the message that Jesus tried to convey to Laodicea because you want to talk about a prosperous church and a prosperous city? That was the epitome of prosperity. And yet... Jesus had some of the most cutting and pointed admonitions for not only this city, but these believers. And guess what? We're going to discover that this church applies to our generation, historically speaking. And so God is speaking to us and warning us of the danger of becoming spiritually proud and complacent to where we become overconfident to the point of opening ourselves up for temptation. Now, as we look at Revelation 3, verse 14, we're going to read the last several verses of Revelation 3 there where the Laodicean message is placed in Scripture. So right there in Revelation 3, verse 14, Jesus says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, there are a lot of important details here, and we hope to survey these as we go through a few thoughts from this point forward. But as I customarily like to do, let me share some thoughts about this ancient city that Jesus is addressing. Let's look at some details about the ancient city itself of Laodicea, and then look at the actual church in that city in John's day. And then we're going to draw some parallels to our time. Ancient Laodicea was a prominent city in Asia Minor where the seven churches were located. It was an outstanding commercial center that provided great opportunities for those who wanted to make money. It was known for its banking industry, its clothing industry, and its health industry. The economic prosperity that this city experienced made it quite affluent and actually financially independent. In fact, when an earthquake destroyed the city in A.D. 60, its citizens were able to rally and raise enough finances to finance the rebuilding of the city themselves. And they actually turned down an, an offer from Rome for financial subsidy because they were able to pay for it themselves. Financial independence made its citizens proud and self-sufficient. And because they were self-sufficient, they felt no need of any outside help. Interesting. And again, I want you to encourage you to be thinking spiritually with these details on that spiritual level. Now, when we look at the Christian church in Laodicea, the believers in this church reflected this very same attitude of the city. Christians in that city experienced no persecution. Could you imagine why? If I might use the modern vernacular, you could say that the Laodicean church had a church hierarchy that functioned efficiently, and their ministers were well paid. They had cutting-edge evangelistic methods and church planning strategies and were involved in active outreach. This great bustle of activity became a substitute for true conversion and primitive godliness. And as they reflected the attitude of the city itself, the church got caught up in its affluence and prosperity to the point to where it conformed to society instead of remaining peculiar in a spiritual sense. And therefore, as a result, it awakened no opposition from the non-Christian secular authorities. As a result, Christians in this city became deadened in their spiritual perception. They lost their sense of a need for Christ and became blind to their true spiritual condition, all the while thinking that they were okay. Pretty serious details here. Now, Christ went on to tell them He knew their works. He told them, listen, I wish you were cold or hot. Because if you were cold, you wouldn't even be professing my name, and I could work with you. And if you were hot, you'd be on fire spiritually, and you'd be doing the work that I've called you to do. But you're somewhere in between. You're lukewarm. And by the way, that was a detail that the Laodicean Christians could relate to, because in the nearby city of Hierapolis, there were hot springs that came out of the ground, and as a result, the water would flow down the six miles to Laodicea, and by the time it got to Laodicea, it, it had cooled down and become lukewarm water. So Jesus was using illustrations that they could relate to here. And he had told them, look, you become tepid, you become lukewarm. You're professing to be on fire, but you're dead spiritually. You're overconfident. You're trying to do the work in your own strength, and you don't see your need of supernatural help. This is what Jesus was telling these believers. They were professing to have an active faith, but they were really proud and content and saw no need of further spiritual growth beyond the status quo. And they were indifferent to their real spiritual condition. Jesus called them rich and increased with goods. They felt that they were rich and increased with goods spiritually. 
Their affluence gave them a false sense of security. But in reality, Jesus called them wretched. They didn't see their own sinfulness. He called them miserable because they had this compromising attitude which meant that they, were, they had no peace within. Right? They were poor because they were not spiritually rich, unlike the church at Smyrna, where Jesus told them, listen, you are poor, but you're really spiritually rich. They were also naked. They, they couldn't in clear conscience claim Christ's righteousness spiritually because of this condition that they were in. And they were naked, or blind rather, because they couldn't see their own true spiritual condition. And because of this condition, which can be summarized as a condition of being self-righteous, Jesus pointedly said, you know what? You're in such a deplorable condition, I actually want to vomit you out. That's a pretty serious detail. In other words, what they were doing sickened him to the point of vomit. And he threatened to cast them off if they didn't turn from their self-confident condition. Now the beautiful point here is that Jesus did not leave them in that condition. That's the beautiful thing about the Lord. He, while He points out spiritual challenges, He always brings the solution to help those who are in that spiritual condition. Amen. Now, He counseled them to buy three things. And these three things actually correspond to the three attributes that He mentioned about Himself in verse 14. He referred to Himself as the Amen the faithful and true witness, and the beginning of God's creation. And He counseled them to buy gold tried in the fire, white raiment, and to anoint their eyes with eye salve. And each of these qualities of Christ corresponds and parallels to each item that Laodicea needs to resolve their spiritual condition. Now, He first referred to Himself as the Amen. This is a term that describes how Christ is immovable, He's unchangeable, and He's unshakable, and so is His truth. Jesus' truth is unmovable and unshakable. Therefore, He counseled them to buy gold tried in the fire, the gold of an unmovable and unchangeable and unshakable faith. And because they were, they were well familiar with the banking industry, which involved the buying and selling of gold, they could relate to that. And, and while that gold might have been speculative at times as far as investments, he was pointing them to a sure investment, an unmovable, unshakable truth, and the gold of faith that he could give them so that they could be spiritually alive again. Now, he also referred to himself as the faithful and true witness, the one true source of godliness and righteousness and Christian character. And therefore, he counseled them to buy the white raiment that he offers, his own spotless righteousness. Because of the life that he lived and the faith that he lived by, it's his righteousness that saves us, not our own. And he told them that, and of course, they were well familiar with that, because not only were they familiar with the banking industry that bought and sold gold, they were familiar with the great clothing industry in Laodicea. So when Jesus used the white raiment illustration, he, could, he was connecting with them on familiar ground. And so He counseled them to, to receive that white raiment of His righteousness. Jesus also referred to Himself as the beginning of the creation of God. Amen. Now this verse, this phrase can be misunderstood, but when you go back to the original language, that word for beginning is arche which the word archangel comes from. And that word means first, or top, or, or start, or head of. So in reality, when Jesus called Himself the beginning of the creation of God, He was saying, I am the head, or the leader, or, or, or the, 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 the commander, if you will, of God's creation. And other texts reveal that He's actually the Creator. So He's pointing Himself He's pointing to Himself as the Creator to this group of people. Because He was sharing with them that through His creative power, He could recreate their hearts. Amen. And pour out the Spirit upon them to give them spiritual discernment, that heavenly eye salve, that they might see things clearly spiritually. 
And so I think it's beautiful how these three qualities relate to these three items that Jesus is offering Laodicea. And by the way, they could relate to that ISAB because there was actually a school of medicine in ancient Laodicea that was associated with a pagan temple, and people often went there to buy this special eye powder that could help them as far as eye problems. So once again, he was meeting them on common ground to be able to share with them an illustration that they could relate to. And so Jesus offered these beautiful, beautiful, beautiful things to help them heal from their spiritual condition. He also reminded them of his intense love for them, brothers and sisters, by saying, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. I love you enough not to let you continue in the condition that you're in. If we were to see our children misbehaving or, or run out into traffic or do some other thing, would we just stand there and say, oh, well, I just want to love them? No, you take steps to prevent them from danger, wouldn't you? To stop them from hurting themselves and to teach them how to govern themselves under the power of God so that they can make good choices. Well, Jesus says, I love you enough to tell you because Jesus never flattered people in sin. He encouraged people. He put an arm around them at times and, and tried to encourage them to be faithful, but he never failed of, of dealing truly with the heart of the issue in someone's life because he knew that that very issue could exclude them from heaven. And it was too important to him, and, and he loved them too much to not tell them what they needed to understand. As many as I love, he says, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So he called them to repentance of this condition that they were facing. And he reminded them, listen, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. I'm at the door of your heart knocking. All you got to do is open the door and let me in and we'll come in and I'll come in and we'll sup together. And this, this phrase implies a merging of the wills to where Jesus' will will swallow up ours and we will be his witnesses once again. And then he made the promise to the overcomer, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Yes. You see, he's calling Laodicea to the overcoming experience, to emulate his own overcoming experience, so that they can be seated on thrones in heavenly places with God the Father and God the Son. And so we can see Jesus earnestly entreating this church who is in a very dangerous spiritual condition, and he called for them to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So what can we learn from this message? How does the Laodicean message relate to us? Well, just to review, I want to remind you that, as I said earlier, the seven churches correspond to seven eras of church history, I believe. And they had a local application in John's day, and certainly there are spiritual qualities that can apply to Christians in every age. But I think it's beautiful how these seven churches also correspond to ages of church history. You've got the church at Ephesus, who, uh, which described the era of the apostles. Then you've got the church at Smyrna that described the, the subsequent era of persecution. Then you've got the era of Pergamos, which described the era of compromise. Then you've got Thyatira, which described the Dark Ages and the era of apostasy. Then you've got Sardis, which describes the era of the Reformation, which took, if you go by years, down to the year 1798. It went down to that year where, when Rome received its deadly wound. And then you had the Philadelphian church, which, de which described an era of revival and godliness, missionary work. And that leads us to the Laodicean period. And by the way, the Philadelphian period, I believe, went from 1798 to 1844. And then Laodicea kicked in. You know the word Laodicea? A people being judged, or judgment of the people. That's what the word means, and therefore describes an era of judgment, the final phase of Earth's history. And that's one of the reasons why our pioneers developed this doctrine of a pre-advent judgment. Laodicea and the understanding of Laodicea is one of, the, one of the nails in the coffin to all other understandings of the judgment as far as the investigative judgment. It helped to nail down that Christ in 1844 began a judgment that would soon end with the close of probation. And so here we find a description of the last generation in earth's history. 
And yet, God's people are in the most serious spiritual condition at the most important time. And God is calling us to realize this because we are living in the final generation, and this message to Laodicea applies to us. Yes. Now, when we look at Adventist church history, our church started off on fire for the truth, and over the course of a few generations, it turned into a global, worldwide movement. In some ways, I think our success as a denomination has given us a complacent spiritual attitude to where we don't see our spiritual need, and we've almost become proud of what we've accomplished as a church. Now, in many ways, the church today is also compromised with the worldly attitude that Western culture promotes, much like the Laodicean believers in ancient Laodicea. And I think we're in danger of having our spiritual perceptions deadened by worldliness, and yet at the same time not even realizing what kind of condition we are in. The danger of affluence can be imperceptible at times and deadly. And so we've got to be very careful. I have a friend who uh, read a book by a man who spent some time in a Cuban prison, spent probably two decades or more in a Cuban prison. And my friend, when he heard that he was going to be possibly crossing paths with this man because this man was eventually let out and he came to the States, and my friend told me about how one day he, wanted, he, he was going to be in the same area as this man, so he tried to set up an appointment with this man who had spent this time in the Cuban prison and now was being a pastor in America, and, and he couldn't cross paths with him in person, so he called him one day and he said, Brother, I have a question for you. Having spent time in that Cuban prison and now being a pastor in America, what was your spiritual walk with Christ like when you compare the two situations? How was it then versus how is it now? And you know what that guy told my friend? He said, I often long to go back to the Cuban jail cell because I was closer to Christ in that cell than I feel like I am here in America because of all the temptation and all the compromise that affects my spiritual walk with God. Now, I couldn't imagine ever wanting to go back to a situation like that, man. That would be horrible. But I think he was un trying, to, trying to delineate the reality that in that situation in Cuba, he felt closer to Christ because it was obviously a much more desperate situation. But friends, at times I really feel like the truths of our message we view as an end unto themselves. And we are in danger of becoming overconfident and not seeing our need of still walking with Christ every day and, and still searching the Scriptures to find a deeper understanding of truth and, and maybe even new truths. Because, you know, as great of light as we have had as Seventh-day Adventists, and that light is probably sufficient to get us into eternity, that does not mean that God does not want to show us even greater things. Amen. Truth is not static. Now, truth is absolute, but it's progressive in the way God unfolds it to us as we can handle it. And I believe there are still greater things to discover. But I think in many cases we become satisfied with our current position. We've got to be very careful because, again, the danger of affluence and, and complacency can make us overconfident. And oftentimes we get caught up in a bustle of activity. But have we substituted this activity for spirituality? You know, there are times when I go home at night and I have a chance to maybe think about the day. And I think to myself, Lord, what did I do today that actually had some saving, eternal good? And I'll find that when I search myself, well, that was not really what I needed to be involved in, and that, and that. This was okay, and this was good, and this was good, but these other things. How did that result in reaching hearts? It's a challenging question we have to think about. Sometimes I think we even here at Mills River get quite busy with a lot of activities. Now I think that's a good thing as long as we don't let it consume us. Sometimes I wish we could just do two or three solid things a year and really pour our energies into them instead of doing maybe 10 or 15 things and having a half-hearted effort in them. You know, I guess it's hard sometimes to find that balance because we want everybody to be involved and we have so many things that we want to 
give to the community around us. And I think that's a good thing. I'm just wondering sometimes if we're in danger here locally of maybe being too busy. Because that can become a substitute for spirituality. And if we never refill the tank, then we're going to trust in the arm of the flesh. And when we're in the flesh, friends, we open ourselves up to ungodly things. We've got to be very careful. Yeah. Now, on a personal level, we must realize that as individual Christians, the message of Laodicea is for us personally. Because it describes the exact condition of many of God's people in the most important time of earth's history. In this quiet moment right now, as you think about some of these things, challenging to think about, how is it with your soul? As you take spiritual inventory of yourself, have you become spiritually complacent and dangerously comfortable? Have you lost your sense of a need for Christ? Do you have that spiritual pride that maybe doesn't allow you to quite see your true spiritual condition and you, you might think you're okay? Is your faith weak? When Jesus knocks on the door of your heart in those early hours of the morning, calling for you to come and meet with Him and check in. One preacher called that punching in the clock in the morning just to check in with Jesus. How do you respond to that? Where is it with your soul right now? How do you respond to the Spirit's call moment by moment when He tries to reach you in your mind to bring you back where you need to be? These are serious questions. But Jesus wants to give us the gold of faith, a strong faith. He wants to give us the assurance of, of peace in our hearts that we can claim Christ's righteousness for ourselves, His righteousness. And He wants to, to, to anoint our spiritual eyes with His heavenly eyes so that our spiritual radar can be discerning and we won't call evil good and good evil. Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 5 verse 20 said, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that call sweet bitter and bitter sweet. That, you know, and, and, and he's alluding to John's words in Revelation 10 about how he ate something that was sweet in his mouth, but it became bitter in his belly. I think in some ways we've lost our discernment as a people. And because we've lost our dependence upon God, we've allowed things to come in. We've got to be very careful. But on a personal level, if we're going to solve this Laodicean condition, a condition, by the way, which God equates with the same condition as the fallen churches, we must realize that we have a personal responsibility. We can't change other people, but we can change ourselves in the strength of Christ. Let me qualify that statement. I, I, we can't even really change ourselves, but we can choose to place ourselves where Jesus can change us. Yes. So that as we place ourselves back in His hand, as we open the door of our hearts and let Him come in, we must choose to allow Him to do that because He won't bang the door down. He won't be like some of those SWAT teams that come in and they just, boom, knock that door down and come right in. Jesus won't do that. He will never force our choice. We have to be free will, free moral agents that will open the door. So if you're dealing with this Laodicean condition in your heart this morning, if you will make a choice to let Jesus come into your life again, this condition that affects Laodicea doesn't have to remain. He can call you out and make you separate, make you peculiar once again in your faith, give you a strong faith, give you a love for souls, give you His righteousness that you have peace in your soul to know that you're in a saving relationship with Him, and He can give you that discernment you need 
so that you're no longer dull spiritually anymore. That your spiritual radar is sharp again and quick to discern between truth and error, between good and evil. So that the blade of your spiritual knife in your mind is sharp once again. He can do that for you. But you have to choose. It doesn't happen by accident. It's got to happen through a calculated choice on our part as individuals to open our hearts and to let Jesus come in and have full control. And I think it's very interesting that during the time of Ephesus, Jesus was walking in the midst of the candlesticks. But yet here, He's outside the door by the end, trying to get back in. So let us let Him back in. Will you choose today to awake from your slumber and become truly spiritual and have a faith that is a conquering faith so that you can be an overcomer just like Jesus was and that He could save you a throne on the sea of glass next to Himself. I'd like to have a throne myself there. But I realize as a minister of Christ, I'm no better than any of you. I must choose myself every day to follow the Lord, and so must you. And so as you think about these things, consider what the Spirit is saying to your mind that you might respond accordingly. Because friends, the Laodicean condition can only result in one thing, and that is eternal death. And we don't want anything to do with that. So let us shake off this condition and become the committed people of God that God wants us to be. And I pray, as you think about this, that you will choose in the areas that God is calling you to choose in so you can have this experience of being right with God so that no ounce of the poison of Laodicea would be in your soul. You have to choose, and I pray that you will choose this morning. And as we sing our closing hymn, which is, I'd rather have Jesus, I pray that this would be the prayer of your heart. So let's stand to our feet, and let's sing hymn number 327, like we mean it, with all of our hearts.
is fairer. He's fairer than lilies of rarest bloom. Sweet, sweeter than honey from out of the gloom. He's all that my hungering spirit needs. I'd rather have Jesus. Does Jesus mean more to you than everything or than anything? Now seriously, God is calling for a wholehearted commitment from every professed believer that takes on the name of Jesus. And I pray today, as we think about this commitment, that we will choose to become that very type of follower, totally committed to the cause of Christ. How many of you will raise your hand with me and make this commitment here before men and angels, before people and angels? God bless you. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for everything that you've done, for every opportunity that you've given us, for caring enough about us to outline the challenges that we face and give us the solution for them. And I pray, Lord, that as we have all raised our hands in this commitment today, that you will fill our hearts with strength and courage and love and joy and peace. That you will help us to see what a privilege it is we have to be a follower of you. And though the world looks with contempt upon your name, may we hold it in the highest esteem and may we be unashamed. Just as Paul said, he is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. May that be the anthem of our lips, Lord. And as we wrestle with the Laodicean attitude that has affected us, Lord, May we cast that off and may we enter into full harmony with you, Lord. May we open the door of our hearts and allow you to have full control. Lord, you expect a complete commitment and dedication. We want to choose that now. And we pray that you will help us through the power of your Spirit to be faithful to this commitment. And as we leave this place today, may we not soon forget the choice, the decision that we've made. And may this decision today be a building block in the foundation and wall of character that we are building so that when the tempest comes, we will stand unmoved. This is the prayer of our hearts today. Bless us now as we leave. May your righteousness fill us and shine from our countenance. In Jesus' name, amen.